took me less than 10 seconds to say it. Yet, from the time of the Prophet Muhammad until now, nobody has been able to produce something of the same poetic, grammatical and linguistic expertise of the Qur'an. And it's worth mentioning here that the Qur'an itself was the main miracle given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes, the Prophet Muhammad did receive miracles like other Prophets. We have narrations of the pagans of Mecca asking him to split the moon. And they said, we'll believe in you if you split the moon. And he pointed to the moon and it split. And other miracles of people were thirsty and water gushed from his hands. And he used this water to, they used this water to drink and bathe themselves. But the main miracle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, is the Quran. Because the people of his time, they were linguistic and poetic experts. And we see from the other miracles of the prophets, like Jesus peace be upon him, the people of his time were experts in medicine. So Allah sent miracles that were medical-like, to do with medicine, to show that yes, you are experts in your field, however this is divine, this is coming from Allah, this supersedes all of your medical skills. And like Musa, the prophet Moses peace be upon him, the people of his time were magicians, so we see that the, the, the miracles he had, his staff become a, sna- a serpent, the splitting of the sea, he was all magical like, but again, so much more, superseding all of their magical skills. So when I started to read more into the Quran, and I started to see with my own eyes, when I started to attend Quran learning classes, a short while after becoming Muslim in my local mosque, and I saw many small children who cannot speak a word of Arabic, memorizing the Qur'an. And then I was told by some of the Muslims, and I started to check this myself, that there are hundreds and thousands of Muslims, sometimes in every country, who memorize the Qur'an by heart. Again, they cannot speak Arabic. And we know that percentage-wise, Muslims are only 10 to 14 percent of Muslims are Arabs. Most of the Muslim worlds do not speak Arabic. But yet, the Qur'an has been memorized by them. And we're not talking about a few scholars, or a few highly intellectual people. We're talking about children, people from all different different nationalities and levels of intellect. However, they have been able to memorize the Quran. And then I went even further into my Quran studies. As, as, you, as you can say, this is where I was 100% without doubt happy with the decision I made. When I started to notice in the Quran, I got hold of a book which mentioned scientific miracles in the Quran. And I started to compare the verses in the book with the actual translation of the Quran. Verses like Allah talking about how the baby develops in the woman's stomach, the embryo, the stage of embryology. How that after the initial conception, that Allah forms into an alaqah. And this word alaqah in Arabic means like a clot, a leech-like clot, and it also means something that hangs. If you wanted to hang something up, you'd say, Allah al he hung up his clothes. So I wrote this, and then it goes on to say that then after this clot, it becomes a mudra, a piece of flesh. And this word in Arabic actually means a piece a flesh as if it's been chewed. And we look now only with modern technology and we see that yes, this stage of the baby, this piece of flesh, it looks exactly like a human has taken a bite into it. And then I went on to the other verses of then the bones and then the flesh. And then I saw that only in modern science, less than a hundred years ago, did they come up with this. We look back at the greatest philosophers that were on this earth, like Aristotle and Plato, and all the ancient Greek, Roman, Chinese, Indian philosophers. Nobody came even close to this. Even in the West, even in the most developed countries who were not reading the Quran, nobody knew this kind of information until the technology of microscopes and ultrasound scans. So I read this, and I went on, and I read about the mountains. But Allah says in Surah al never that the mountains are like pigs. And in another verse he says that the mountains are there to make the earth firm. And if they were not there, the earth would shake. And then I saw what else? Another scientific fact. That only in the last 40 to 50 years have they confirmed that every mountain, just as tall as the mountain is, it has roots underneath it that are just as long or even longer. 
And what do these pigs do? Just as Allah says in the Quran, they keep the earth firm. And if they were not there, we would have constantly regular earthquakes. So I said to myself, and I always say to everybody, how could the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how could he have known this one, one thousand, over 1,400 years ago? He was a man who could not read and write in the desert. Who could provide him with such information when even a, less than 100 years ago, in the best of educational institutes and scientists who from the non-Muslim world did not have any idea how this happens? So the only solution, the only answer is that this was from the Creator. And then, obviously when I became a Muslim, I received, you could say, some kind of backlash, some kind of negativity from my family. I mean, I didn't have, as I've heard very you know, bad stories, and if you look at the Sahaba, we hear about the Sahaba were tortured, how they were, how Bilal was tied up by the Allah, and, and how a heavy rock was placed on him, and how people would drag them through the streets, and how they were tied up until their bodies would burn. So Alhamdulillah, we didn't receive anything like this, but all naturally my family were very upset when I became Muslim. And they came to me, and they said to me, why are you becoming Muslim? Muslim is, you know, Muslims are Pakistanis and Arabs, you know. It's, this is not a religion for English people. And I, I know my grandmother said that to me, and I said to my grandmother, I called her grandma, I said, Grandma, I said, where was Jesus from? Was Jesus from the UK? Was he from America? Was he from Germany? Was he not from the Middle East? Was Abraham, peace be upon him, not from the Middle East? So the prophets are all from the Middle East. So if Islam is a foreign Middle Eastern religion, then so is you know, my previous and your religion of Christianity. And I found that they had a lot of negative ideas about Islam. You know, people doing things in the name of Islam that are completely against Islam, which we see even till today. People having cultural practices that people think are from Islam. For example, we see in the UK, I haven't seen that here, I don't know the reason, but I see from certain people from certain areas in the world, the man will walk and his wife will be walking five or six footsteps behind him, as if she is his hired help, like she's not even related to him. So I remember people saying things like this to me, but you know, Muslims don't respect women. I know a Muslim neighbor of mine, his wife, she walks behind him. And certain parts of London, they'd say to me, you know, Muslims are, are dirty because they see certain people eating palm and spitting on the floor in reality. Obviously, palm is against Islam and so is spitting on the floor. But they would see these things and they would think that Islam is this kind of culture. So I received a lot of problems in the beginning. My father tried to um, uh, put a lot of pressure on me. We have a thing in the UK which is called social services. Now, if a child is considered to be a naughty child, misbehaving child, the parent can say to the government, my child, he's out of control, I cannot control him, please can you take him? So you may take them with a bunch of other misbehaving children. So my father, and I don't believe that he really would have done that, but at the time obviously it was a, you know, he was, maybe it was more of a threat. He said to me, if you don't, you know, stop doing this, stop going to your Muslim friends, stop praying, because at that time he would come sometimes to my room and he'd find the prayer mat, he'd find the Quran and he'd take them away and throw them away, humble the English translation, he'd throw them away. So he tried to put a lot of pressure on me. And it came to a stage where I, for a short period of time, I actually left home at the age of 15. I was so worried that my father was going to put me in this uh, social services that I left home and for a period of time and I had to literally live in a mosque for about one year. But Alhamdulillah, uh, me and my father, you know, we made up and Alhamdulillah after that everything, everything came normally. He realized this wasn't a teenage rebellion, this wasn't um, a phase I was going through, it wasn't a fashion. Many people, they become punk, punk rockers or goths or emos for a few years and then they grow up and they grow out of it. So he realized that this was something serious that I'd taken the commitment. So I didn't really, you know, receive too much negativity. What I did find difficult is sometimes finding Muslims who had the passion for the religion that I had become a Muslim and I was very happy and I wanted to become a better Muslim and learn more. And I found a lot of the Muslims around me were going the opposite way. They were more interested in being English than being a Muslim. So I had that problem. For example, in my school, after being Muslim, I started to pray as soon as I could. Even if, even I would hold the book, or I'd put the book on the prayer mat and I'd read from it, which you shouldn't really do, but I didn't know any better. So I started to pray. And I'd come to my Muslim friends and I'd say to them, 
it's a Vuhu prayer, you know, it's a lunchtime prayer. Let's go and pray in the classroom. And they're like, oh, you know, it's lunchtime. The best food in the canteen will finish. So they'd go, I'd go by myself and I'd pray. And yes, people would sometimes walk past the classroom. People would see me from outside through the window and they'd come and make fun of me and laugh at me and say, you're trying to be a Pakistani? You're trying to be an Indian? What's wrong with you? You're English. Why are you praying like these Pakistani people? But I, you know, I took it in my stride and I tried to explain to them. I even tried, from my very limited knowledge, I tried to give them da'wah, all that I could, but I continued. And even when it came to every day, the Asr prayer, the school bell would ring, it's time to go home, but it's also time for Asr. So I go to my Muslim friends and say, let's go and pray Asr. And they'd say to me, oh, we're going to miss the bus, and we don't want to wait 20 minutes for the next bus. So again, I found myself going in this classroom, praying by myself. So I was not probably not the only new Muslim in the whole of the school, maybe in, at that time in the whole of the area, but I was the only Muslim praying in the school. So it was, it was a, you know, a lot of pressure, but alhamdulillah, I managed to, um, I managed to you know, keep on the path, and I managed to overcome it. And I managed, what I started to do, is I started to travel. And we know that in Islam, emphasis on knowledge is important, even if you have to travel. And we know from the scholars of the past, people would travel continents, over countries, months and months, just to find one hadith. So I didn't do anything like that, of course, I did a simple bus ride. But I started to take a bus ride out of my area, about an hour's journey, to a mosque, where I could find people who were praying, where they had lessons to learn from the Qur'an, etc. Um, before I come to the end of, of, my, of my speech, I'd really like to give some advice to the Muslims. Muslims who really wish and they want to pass on this message. Really what I'd like to say is the, the main thing we should focus on is spreading the message of Tawheed. Spreading the message of the oneness of Allah. Showing the people the reality of Islam. Clearing the misconceptions and focusing on Tawheed. Yes, it is very good to memorize lots of verses of the Bible or of the, of the, of the Hindu scriptures or the Buddhist paddings and all the various scriptures. It's good to some extent to memorize some verses. But I would say, in my opinion, it's more important to learn the history behind these scriptures. Can, are they still untouched? Are they corrupt? Will they change in any way? That's more important. And your focus should not be on just memorizing verses of the Bible, for example, and making this your da'wah. And recently, the, the great scholar, Sheikh Abdelaziz Ali Sheikh, the Grand Mufti in Saudi Arabia, one of the greatest scholars alive, he was asked by a caller, should I focus myself on learning the scriptures and use this as my main point in da'wah? And he said, no. He said, you do what the prophets did, what the Sahaba did, what the four Imams did, what all of the scholars did. They focused on calling the people to Tawheed and use the Qur'an as the final revelation. Use the Qur'an as the hujjah. Show them the Qur'an. So that is the main focus that we should focus our da'wah on. But it is important at the same time, yes, to learn some comparative religion, especially when you're talking about the history of religions and how they've changed over time and how the Qur'an and Islam hasn't. Now, how should we give da'wah? A very, you know, a few small tips. First of all, speak to whoever you know. If you have non-Muslim family, maybe some of you do, if you have non-Muslim friends, it's our duty to convey the message. And we've been told in the Quran to call people to Islam. When Allah said to us, to invite or call people to the way of the Lord in a way which is better and good and using kind words and debate and discuss with them in a good way. And we see so many people giving da'wah in a very forceful way, in a very proud way. And I've even seen with my own eyes, da'is, when the person they're giving da'wah to doesn't understand the concept they said to them or doesn't necessarily agree and they're free. We cannot force people. You give your da'wah, the person says, I don't understand, I don't agree. I've seen guys laughing at people. How can you not agree? Laughing in their face. How can you not agree? It's so clear. So that's important. We implement this verse when we give them da'wah. We speak to them in a, in, a, in a kind way, in a way that is better. We do not, we do not be sarcastic, we don't, we don't be aggressive, and we don't take an uh, attitude of pride. And another way, and this is something we can all do, and we know the Prophet said, Convey my message even if it's one verse. Who of us does not know one verse? 
Do all of us here from the Muslims know Surah Al Ikhlas? We do. Do all of us know what Surah Al Ikhlas means? The translation?